Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. It's almost as though I can hear your voices uh, proclaiming the great truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, from your homes, from where you're at. And uh, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Welcome to the Resurrection Sunday service at Emmanuel Bible Church. My name is Pastor Mark Hazen, and I'm glad to be sharing this time with you today as we remember Jesus Christ and as we rejoice in him. Of course, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is foundational to the Christian faith. It's foundational to what we know and believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we would have no foundation for faith in anything that he said. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we would have no foundation for faith in anything that he did. We would have no foundation for faith in him. He would not be a worthy object of our faith. He would be a dead imposter. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, he, we would still be lost in our sin without God and without hope in this world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is risen, he is risen indeed. Uh, he is risen literally, bodily. Uh, the man who they nailed to the cross, the man who they placed in the tomb is the man who came out of the grave. Jesus, he is risen, he is the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in him are joined to him and to his victory. Uh, the scripture tells us plainly, Jesus died for our sin, he rose for our salvation. Those who trust in him are forgiven and redeemed and adopted into God's family as God's very own children. They are given eternal life. This is glory. Jesus' resurrection secured and guaranteed our resurrection and our reconciliation to God and our relationship with him and our eternal salvation. So we praise God for Jesus Christ and we thank God for Jesus and for the victory that he has given us in Jesus. So an appropriate way for us to begin our time together this morning as we remember and rejoice in Jesus is to look to God in prayer. And so let's do that this morning and uh, thank God for Jesus. But let's begin our time in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're gathered this morning in your presence, uh, separated from one another, but gathered together uh, for the purpose of worshiping you, uh, glorifying you, exalting you, remembering your gift of grace and love to us in the person of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you gave him to us, the Son of your love, because you loved us. And Christ willingly came to become a sacrifice for our sin. We're grateful that he died for us, that he died in our place, that he took our punishment, that he bore in his own body our sin, and that you were pleased with his sacrifice, and that you demonstrated your pleasure and your satisfaction in him by raising him from the dead. We're grateful that Jesus Christ is our risen, living, eternal Savior. And we, we exalt him this morning, and we acknowledge all that you have done for us uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, we're here this morning to remember Jesus and rejoice in Jesus, and we pray that you, uh, by your spirit, would minister your word and your grace to us today. We pray that we would turn our attentions and our affections to you, and that you would minister your grace to us. Bless now this time in your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as most of you know, Lynn and I have four adult children, uh, three daughters and a son. And uh, through them, we have gained two sons-in-law and a daughter-in-law, and through them, we've gained five children. Uh, now, this could go without saying, but I'm glad to say it. We love our children. Uh, we love our married children. We love our grandchildren. Uh, the family is very dear to us. We love them deeply. Uh, we love them more than we love ourselves. We delight in them. Now here's something interesting about our family, but it's true of every family and it's true of every person. As we observe our children, as we have observed our children, as they have grown up in our home and now as they're married and have their own homes, as we observe them, we see in them characteristics and attributes of ourself in them. While they are unique in personality and temperament and character and being, they are unique individuals, uh, yet there are dispositions and character traits in them that we know they receive from us. And so we might observe them and we say, oh, that, that looks like me. Uh, whether that's good or bad, because of our imperfections, we see in them some of our traits uh, that are good and some that are not so good. Uh, our children are unique mirrors of our own lives. We see ourselves in them. 
Uh, matter of fact, uh, our children who have been married, the ones who have married into the family, as they've gotten to know their spouse and as they've gotten to know Lynn and myself, uh, they notice this reality as well. And they might say, oh, you are your father's daughter, or you are your, your mother's son or your father's son, and, and they recognize that. Now, as you think about that reality, think about this. God the Father has observed his Son from all eternity. And the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom the Father has observed from all eternity, uh, the Father says about the Son, look at my Son, he is my delight, he is my joy, look at him, look at his glory. And the Father sees in the Son the Son's perfections, and he sees reflected in his Son his own perfections, and he delights in his Son. And his son is the son whom he loves. And of course, the reverse of that is also true. The son from all eternity has observed the father. And he says of the father, look to my father. Uh, Look at his glory. He is great. He's greater than everyone. And the son sees in the father his own, the father's own perfections and his own perfections reflected back to him. And the father loves the son. And the son loves the father. And they have delighted in one another for all eternity. Now because God is triune, three in one, we could include the Holy Spirit in this conversation. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, from all eternity they have observed one another and they have observed in the other the perfections that are found there. There are no imperfections to be seen, there are no imperfections there, but they have observed in the other the perfections of the other and their own perfections reflected back to them. And here's the point. God has delighted in God from all eternity. Now that's an interesting thought, uh, something you've probably not thought about recently, but God has delighted in God from all eternity. And here's what's fascinating. It is his delight in the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit, it is his delight that is the glory and the joy and the happiness of heaven. Heaven is a happy place because God is a happy God. And he is happy in the other and in the perfections that he sees in the other and the perfections that are reflected back on him. God is happy in the perfections that are displayed in the other and God is humble. God continually gives his full attention to the other and he seeks to advance the glory of the other. God is happy, God is humble, and God is love. The Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father. Uh, God is love because there's always been another to be loving towards. So God is happy, God is humble, and God is love. And this happiness and this humility and this harmony is the happiness and the joy of heaven. Heaven is a happy place because God is a happy God. If God were not happy, no one would want to be there. But God is a happy God. He has delighted in the other for all eternity. Now that I've got you thinking this morning, think with me for a few moments of the love that the Father has for the Son. The Father loves the Son. We could say it this way, God loves Jesus. Think with me for a few moments about this. Uh, Jesus, the second member of that Holy Trinity, Jesus, the Son of God, was chosen by God before the foundation of the world to come and reveal God to us and to be our Savior. And in his coming and in his saving work, God is glorified as he is revealed and as his people are rescued. Uh, Jesus, the Son of God, loved by God, was born of a virgin. He took on flesh and became one of us. God the Son became a man. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. In Colossians 1, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And in Hebrews 1, in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So Jesus is God come to us, come to communicate God to us. Now think about all that God sees in Jesus and all that he loves in his Son as he sees his son's perfections, and in his son's perfections, his own perfections reflected back on him. Think about this. Jesus is infinitely glorious, and yet infinitely humble. Jesus, the one who the book of Revelation reveals as shining brighter than the sun, infinite in glory, 
is infinitely humble. He's the one who would come to be a servant of all and to die on a cross. Jesus, who is equal with God, is obedient to God. Jesus, who is worshiped as God, is reverent toward God. Jesus, who is self-sufficient, is entirely God-reliant. Jesus, who is sovereign over all, is yet patient and kind and merciful. Jesus, who is perfect in justice, is infinitely abounding in grace. Jesus, in all of his diverse perfections, which we could talk about all day long, Jesus, who is perfect in all of his perfections, is the praiseworthy object of his Father's loving affections. And he always has been, and he always will be. When we consider Jesus Christ and his coming to reveal God to us and to rescue God's family unto himself, uh, we, we are reminded of the fact that Jesus is God's communication to us. Yet, while Jesus was here, there were times when God the Father himself burst out in audible praise of his Son, uh, you might be thinking back to when Jesus was baptized, when he comes up out of the water and the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, a, a voice booms from heaven. As the Father says, this is my beloved Son, with him I am well pleased. A little later in Jesus' life and ministry, when Jesus is all alone with Peter, James, and John, he is transfigured before them. And a voice again booms from heaven and it says, God says of his son, this is my beloved son. This is the son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. God loves Jesus. The father loves the son. Now with all that backdrop, we need to consider our next word spoken by Jesus from the cross. Uh, we've been in this series, we've been listening to Jesus speak from the cross. We've heard Jesus speak from the cross and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We hear Jesus speaking from the cross to the criminal and saying, today, truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. We've heard Jesus speaking from the cross to his mother and say, woman, behold your son. But now Jesus is gonna speak from the cross and he's gonna say these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if God so loves Jesus and from all eternity has observed his son and glorified his son and, and, and expressed his love and affection for his son from all eternity and sees in his son his son's perfections and his own perfections, and if God loves Jesus, how is this happening? Why is this happening? Why would God forsake him and let him die on the cross? We love our children. We delight in our children. We would do anything to jump quickly to the rescue of our children to keep them from pain and harm. How is it that God the Father now at the cross turns away and forsakes the Son, the Son of his love at the cross? That's a big question. Let me just say this. God's love for his Son has not diminished at the cross. For his love for his Son never changes. He's not turning away from the son and forsaking the son because of a change in his attitude or affections. No, he loves his son and even at the cross he is not forsaking his son because his affections for his son have changed. That's not true. Let me also say this, God is not forsaking his son, Jesus Christ, because he loves you and me more than he loves his son. Uh, that's not possible. So what is happening uh, what is happening on the cross? Why is Jesus dying on the cross? Why is the Father forsaking the Son? Well, remember with me why Jesus came. Jesus came to reveal to us his Father's glory. Jesus came to reveal to us his Father's worth. Jesus is God's communication to us and he reveals to us his Father's perfections. In our own attitude and in our own actions, uh, we have treated God as though he's not that great. Uh, in our own attitude and actions, we have treated God as though he's not worthy to be the center of our life, the center of our story. We have belittled him as though he's not worth much. And Jesus has come to set the record straight. He is infinitely worthy. And his glory is great. And our sin belittles his glory. And Jesus has come to take away that which belittles his father. He will say, this is how I honor my father's glory. This is the end to which I will go. I will die to honor my father's glory. 
Jesus has come to reveal to us his Father's glory. How much does he love his Father's glory? So much that he will bear away in his own body sin which belittles his Father's glory. From the cross, Jesus the Son is saying, this is how much my Father's glory is worth to me and is worth infinitely. Remember why Jesus came? He came to reveal to us his Father's glory. Jesus came to rescue his father's children. The scripture tells us Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And this also is to the father's glory. Our sin belittles the father's glory. Our sin has cut us off from God and has earned us judgment. But because God loves us, because Jesus loves us, Jesus dies for our sin. To show how much he treasures his father's glory and to give his father's love to you and to me, Uh, people who have offended God with their sin. This is the stretch, this is the reach, this is how far God will go, God the Son will go to glorify his Father and to rescue sinners. A payment for our sin must be made and Jesus will pay for sin himself at the cross. This is what he's doing at the cross. He is becoming sin for us because God loves us. Christ loves us. And this is how far God will go to rescue his own family, to rescue his children. Uh, Jesus' death is for our sin. His resurrection is for our salvation. At the cross, sin has been paid for. Pardon has been made. And in the resurrection, death has been defeated and eternal life has been given. Through the work of the cross, through the power of the resurrection, those who believe on Jesus and trust in him are joined with Jesus and come into his victory. Oh, glorious victory, the old song says. At the cross, Jesus is rescuing his father's children. Also, Jesus, the father rescued children, will see and share in the son's glory. This is what Jesus has come to secure. The father's rescued children those who by God's grace have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, they will see and share in the Son's glory. This is the end to which we have been saved. And this, if you remember from the beginning of the message, is the happiness of heaven. God is a happy God because he has been forever happy in the pleasures and the perfections of his Son. He loves his Son and the Son loves the Father and heaven is a happy place The happiness of heaven is the Father's delight in the Son and the Son's delight in the Father. And the Son has come, Jesus has come to reveal the Father's glory, to rescue his Father's children and the adopted children of God will share in the glory of the Son. This is what Jesus prayed for in John chapter 17. If you were to turn there and read that, I would encourage you to read that whole chapter. But in this prayer that that God has for his disciples, he says this, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. There's that love and glory connection. The Father has eternally loved the Son and has glorified the Son. And now Jesus has come to pay for our sin, to rescue us unto God, so that his glory, the glory that he has experienced from all eternity, and the love that he has known from the Father from all eternity, so that those rescued children will see it and share in it. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us, Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him the joy of bringing many sons and daughters to glory. This is very profound. Uh, this is the meaning of the cross. This is the, uh, the, the, the meaning of the cross, and this is what the resurrection secures. At the cross, Jesus was taking our sin upon himself and dying in our place. At the cross, Jesus was fulfilling and completing the Father's plan put in place before the foundation of the world to reveal God's attributes, his justice and love, his wrath and mercy, his severity and kindness, his hatred of sin and his love for sinners. And at the cross, Jesus is revealing the glory of God in all of its vast extremes. At the cross, Jesus is taking upon himself the full hatreds of of, uh, God's hatred for sin. And at the cross, Jesus is giving himself as God's gift of love for the world. Jesus isn't going through the cross 
to make a reluctant father forgiving. And the father isn't forcing this sacrifice upon an unwilling son. No, together they are completing a work that they set out to do before creation. Jesus is glorifying his father. He's rescuing sinners and he's rescuing them unto his own glory. Rescuing sinners unto the experience that he has enjoyed for all eternity with his father. At the cross, the father is not diminished in his love for his son. No, he is loving the son and through his son he is loving sinners who will believe on him and be saved by him. Jesus the Son of God, will go through hell to glorify his Father because he loves his Father and he is his Father's delight. Jesus, the Son of God, will go through hell to rescue sinners like you and me because the Father and the Son and the Spirit, they love sinners. And Jesus will go through hell to show and share with the redeemed and forgiven children of his Father his own glory. Let me put this message together for you this morning. God loves Jesus. That's where we began. The Father loves the Son. God loves Jesus. God forsakes Jesus at the cross. There's that tension. My God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? God loves Jesus. God forsakes Jesus at the cross. Jesus is forsaken at the cross to glorify his Father and to rescue sinners unto God. God raised Jesus from the dead to glorify the Son and to share his Son's glory with those who have believed on him. That's the message for the morning. That's the message of the cross. That's the message of the resurrection. You know, we, uh, we look at our children and we see in our children attributes, character traits of ourselves uh, whether they're good or bad, we see them and, and, and we love our children. And, and our love for our children is undiminished. We, we love them intensely. God the Father looks at the Son, God the Son, and he loves his Son. And he sees in the Son his perfections reflected back to him. And he delights in, Je- and he delights in Jesus. There are no perfections to be found there. And yet God forsakes Jesus at the cross For Jesus becomes sin for us to display his Father's glory, to reveal and give the Father's love to undeserving sinners, and to share with them, rescued sinners, his own glory. You know, according to Ephesians chapter 1, I won't have you turn there this morning, but according to Ephesians chapter 1, for all who have believed on God and received Jesus as God's provision for their salvation, God forgives them, and God redeems them. And God adopts them as his own. He gives them an inheritance. He blesses them with every spiritual blessing. He joins them to Jesus and he seats them with Christ in the heavenly realms so that in the coming ages he might reveal to them the inexhaustible riches of his grace expressed in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You know, we're not just saved to go to heaven when we die. We've not been saved unto a place. We've been saved unto a person through Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross, through his powerful resurrection, and through faith in Jesus Christ, we're reconciled unto God, and he is glorious, and he is happy, and he is humble, and he is love, and he is the delight and the glory of heaven. Heaven is a happy place because God is a happy God. Again, I can summarize the message this way. Uh, We are saved, we are saved unto God, we are saved to see Jesus' glory, we are saved to share in his inheritance, and we are saved to be satisfied and sustained forever in the love that the Father has for the Son. God looks at his Son and he says, "I I love him, I delight in him, he is my joy, he always has been and he always will be, and God looks at those who have believed him and received Jesus as their Savior, and he says, I I love them, I delight in them, they are my joy. They will see my son's glory and I will share it with them forever. Uh, The book of John, 1 John says, chapter three, behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. And when Jesus appears, when he comes again, we shall see him and we will be like him and share in his glory forever. What immeasurable grace how remarkable, very profound. This is what the cross means and this is what the resurrection 
secures. Now this morning I've referenced just a number of passages of Scripture. I've not had you turn to any one of them, but I've, I've talked about uh, John chapter 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, John chapter 17, Ephesians 1 and 2. Our text for this morning is Matthew chapter 17, where Jesus cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we've dealt with that this morning. But I'd like to close our service this morning, and if you have your Bibles with you, I'd have you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to take just a little bit of time here as we close out our time together by reading 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, and uh, down quite a ways into the chapter. But listen along and follow along as I read 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that word blessed could also be interpreted happy. Happy is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls." Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Let me close this morning in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come and we stand in awe of you, in awe of who you are, in awe of how you have revealed yourself to us, in awe in how you have given your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come and communicate yourself to us so that we might know who you are, so that we might know who you are, who you are like and, and what you have done for us. We thank you that you sent your Son. We're grateful that Jesus willingly came. He took on flesh and he became one of us. And he became one of us for a purpose, to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In his own body, he bore away our sin, revealing to us how glorious you are, how worthy you are. He came and bore away our sin in his body so that we might be rescued unto the Father, so that we might see and share in his glory for all eternity. We're grateful that you were pleased with your Son, and you displayed your satisfaction by raising him from the dead. We thank you that those who trust in your son are joined to him and to his victory. Their sin is forgiven. They are adopted into your family. They become your very own. And we set our hope fully on the grace to be given us when Jesus returns. We shall see him. We will be like him. And we'll share in this relationship that you have enjoyed forever. Oh, what grace to us. We cannot begin to comprehend how far you have brought us from sinners separated from you to children of your very own. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the resurrection. 
We thank you for the foundation that we have for our faith in Jesus Christ. And through him, we belong to you. Father, I pray that you'd bless our congregation. I pray that you'd bless the family of Emmanuel Bible Church. I pray that they might be encouraged, that they might have their faith built up, that they might have their eyes turned to you and to Jesus Christ today and look forward to his return with great expectation. I thank you for our time together this morning. Bless, now us, bless us now as we uh, continue to worship you, as we continue to sing songs to you and pray to you and worship you in manifold ways. We thank you for all of this in Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, it's been good to spend these few moments with you this morning as we have reflected upon the Lord Jesus Christ, his coming, his death, his resurrection, and his return. Looking forward to seeing you sometime soon. Until then, we'll keep you in our prayers. God bless you. Have a great Resurrection Sunday.